Welcome back to This Is Hardcore Podcast. You just heard Hold My Own. This track is nothing left. It is off the upcoming self-titled EP, which comes out August 5th. Pre-order now through Retribute Records and Corruption Records. This is the band featuring Greg Falcetto, the Mongoloids, and all these other projects he had started over the years, who was also the stage manager and major tech support throughout the entire This Is Hardcore Fest for the last bunch of years. On shit from MH Chaos and all these other crazy bands and Shane Roundhouse and Cynacrosis and The Killer, Shane Merrill who does The Rumble, which is coming out that same weekend, August 5th, and a bunch of Chicago guys. Crazy the way things work. Guy from New Jersey who's been in a bunch of bands ends up in a band with a bunch of guys from Chicago. All because of FYA and hardcore and all the things. And with the amazing technology and the ability with Greg's job to travel, they're making it work. Hold My Own will also have a split out on Never Ran, Never Will Records, which is Richie Crush from Wisdom Machine's new label. An offshoot of Fast Break, which is in the works. And as I said on previous podcasts, it's why we had Hold My Own and Carried by Six by Back, Back by Back to Back, actually, at the Thursday of This Is Hardcore. Now, I, I had thought that it would have been easier to get guests leading up to and post This Is Hardcore, but it wasn't the case. And so, between my computer doing exactly what it does to me when I need it most, this is the first time I'm able to jump on and this thing start running. So, let's get into the episode. Whether you are shivering with cold or too hot, sleepy or wide awake, spoken well of or badly, dying or doing anything else, do not let it interfere with doing what is right. For what causes us to die is also one of life's processes. Even for this, nothing is required of us than to accomplish well the task at hand. From Marcus Aurelius's fantastic and must read for the budding Stoics and all of us, the meditations. When I think of this quote, it brings a lot of different past mistakes made in the way that I handle projects in the process of, or as they're running. And through the various years of This Is Hardcore, It has became commonplace amongst friends to kind of leave Joe alone and fly off the handle. And I let way, way, way too much simple things that are just not important feel like the entire world was crushing on me. Through the years, um, there was just... I I could use the sidestep of, well, I had a lot going on. 2006, I was arrested. 2007... Eight, I was going through the court process looking at at least 10 years in jail. 2009 was the year of the fest where I was actually on house arrest and had to get off for the dates around the festival and be able to do the fest. And it wasn't until 2010 where I was actually on parole and out and living without the threat of potential imprisonment over my head, though on parole had to be on the best of behaviors. And personal life aside, the ups and downs, it still was supposed to be my responsibility to do the things that needed to get done to do what's right. And at times, we can say mental health-wise, I wasn't at my best. And maybe this project, this looming thing, that I had created was a solid, like a, I don't know, the, I don't know the particular right term to use, but at times there was some solace in just having a project of that magnitude to work on, things to keep my mind occupied, and yet still for well over a dozen years, you know, crazy to say a dozen years, 2006 to 2018. Myself was a dozen years. At times I was absolutely a nightmare to be around as I'm engaged in the process of trying to make people around me, 
people that travel far, people that decided to take the time off from their own work, jobs, families, to those who played. And it's incorrigible. And looking back at it, there's a, you know, there's that moment of embarrassment for me. And with time off and different perspectives and without something like a This Is Hardcore in my life gave me a new vantage point to realize not only its importance in the world of Joe Hardcore, in the calendar year, so to speak, the things that keep my brain from, you know, just firing off and fucking internally rotting, but also just the, the, the good the good that comes from the few moments I have with a friend who came from so far. The friend or two or four who I haven't seen in years and I have five minutes to say hello to them because that's all I can do because there's a lot of other things going on. And I haven't always been the best representative for the festival, not made the best accounting of myself. And a lot of that did pop back up in my mindsets as I was looking at the fest in 2022. It is easier to set a good example and have a good reputation than try to fix a bad reputation. And the reputation amongst my closest friends in my own relationships have been, when it comes to the fest, that I'm a, I'm a fucking nightmare. And so I made the promise to myself and then verbally to others to, for accountability that I was going to be completely more serene and not rude. And... I feel like I did that job. You know, I feel as if what I could do and how it worked best was that I would take a breath and let the position that was happening in front of me, it was a verbal, someone stating, hey, this is what's going on. Like a couple of minutes, I was a little bit frustrated. You know, there's always going to be frustration. And this year was without a doubt times where even in the best moments, there was a lot of frustration and a lot of hard, very quick, split-second decisions to make. Something that I wanted to walk away from with a cool head and the person who's listening to what I'm saying not feel like those words were abusive. And, and to that goal, I, I met it, and I feel a better person, a stronger leader, and a better friend for doing so. And, it, you know, I took the third or fourth reading of Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Somewhere in the summer I started again in 2021 and finished about February of 2022, that really started to sink in how I can put these principles into place so that way I wouldn't be the tyrant, the furor, the fucking hot-headed, can't be talked to, don't, don't, you know, don't bother them kind of person during the fest. There are some thoughts that I, I took down from the Marcus Aurelius world that made it easier. My first one is that he said, we came into the world for the sake of one another. And in that, this is hardcore, exists because the people that play in the bands are also the people that want to see the other bands. The people who aren't in bands want to support everybody. The people that have chosen to help out at the fest want to make everybody's experience better. The Greg Daly, who is the amazing tour manager and overall cat herder and business-minded person that the day of the festival handles, paying out the bands and the logistics... He has a great mind for this, to, to, to take on that responsibility for the sake of us so it can get done. Because I, I pull these things together. There's information that I have. It goes to Greg Daly and Greg Faltretto of Hold My Own. And then they diligently organize and make these things happen. Previous years, I never had that. First five or six years, besides Sean Agnew, Jeff Ziga, You know, a lot of it was just half-assed. And over the years, I learned to be better with organizing ideas, better with transferring information to other people so they could carry out the plans. But I do truly believe 
that we are in the world for the sake of one another and that the community itself exists because of it's a community and i felt very strongly in that throughout the entire festival whether the early days and then even into today's current model which we'll get into further the things that i really gripped onto and kept rereading was just thoughts that he had had on making mistakes and how they're just the result of people's ignorance, not understanding really the process or how these things are interlinked. Also, you know, the idea of the amount of mistakes that I've made. There was times where I was talking to people who were helping me as if I, I was impervious to mistakes and that was something that I've really worked on in the last bunch of years, more than the last two, to take more ownership, except that I have enough flaws and that if someone fucks up, it's equal to 10 mistakes I've probably made or more. And then there is a lot to be said when you're dealing with personalities, positions that you may not agree with, that throughout the festival, where there's a negotiation of bands fees, where you're looking at the way that people who are working at the venues or are doing specific tasks in the venue venue departments, ticketing, etc., they're coming from specific positions. And in lieu of trying to be a tyrant and completely fascist, authoritarian, my way or the highway, I kind of have learned to listen to how their processes work how their mindset is and there's actually an interesting window where it's like you have I had a couple aha moments seeing how they look at the process and letting them in lieu of being like saying hey Joe how do you want to do it I would say well how would you do it what what is your perspective on this and what did you do that worked and there's a quote that I have stuck on my laptop that I use all the time now That's also from mediations and um, a lot of things are means to some other end. You have to know an awful lot before you can judge other people's actions with real understanding. And that envelops a lot of what I just said. I don't know everything about everything. I have an idea, but usually, and especially lately, I allow the person's position or their job to dictate that they will know more of the process than I do. And I've kind of accepted that in lieu of trying to be the master of all these things, but to just have the right people around. And so some of the details aren't even necessary to me because the person who knows the best have that in their head. And it makes so much more sense to give them what Jocko Willink would call the decentralized command. The person who knows best is going to make the best decision because doesn't make sense for them to make the less than best decision and in lieu of trying to contradict them allow them to do what they know best and keep my fucking opinion and mouth shut because i don't know an awful lot about every single nuanced detail of every piece that goes into this thing i just understand a broader picture of it all a lot of what used to get me down as the as the fest began or started to was pessimism And I really think that if you allow pessimism to start into your head in any project or endeavor, you're already putting a dark cloud that's going to make things look so much more dim than it really is. And, you know, we legitimately were looking at rain. And I had said to Bob, man, I don't give a fuck if we even set these things up until 2 p.m. Saturday. And everybody else is just going to have to wait for us because we're not going to get soaked. And Bob had come to me and said, listen, man, no one wants to set up at 2 o'clock. And, you know, if we just get up early and just do it, it'll be done. And that was a great way to have a friend who in, intimately knows the whole process has been from the very first tense. Bob and the team have been a big part of the thing. But to have another perspective show some light, like, yeah, it may rain, but you may not. So let's count on it not raining. And let's get it fucking done instead of being like, this is going to fucking suck. And it was good to have that moment where someone could come in and give some sun. And and it actually worked out. We showed up. 
the fastest tents we've ever put up. A completely new team, completely new structure, a new setup, and yet we fucking killed it. And there was some drizzle and some rain, but we were prepared. And what Marcus would say to this is, how much more damage and anger and grief do than the things that cause them? And that's really what it is. You, I could, I was griefing myself at like 12 o'clock at night Friday being like, this is going to fucking suck. It's going to rain. And we should have just gone ahead. And that's what we did. And it was good to have a, a perspective of that. You know, and it was important to have that. And that's why I want to talk about that as well. For me, thinking about the amount of times that I've let outside opinions from the internet world really get me into a dark thing. And I'm never going to be a fan of reading people post, but specifically pre, like, guess I can't make the fest. Good thing Hate 5 6 is there. It's like, you know, Sonny's one of my best friends in the world. His relationship and mine is, you know, awesome, great. I love the guy. There's times I fucking want to punch him in the face just because I hate hearing people that would choose to sit at home and watch a video instead of being there. But that's the new way. And also people saying like, oh, I guess I'll have to wait for next year. And I've always said this, and it's still something that sits with me, where this isn't a bus. There's no guarantees. And like... I said in the last episode, nothing in hardcore is so big it won't fail. Support is support. Now, this fest was heavily supported. People from all over the world representing Europe, South America. It's fucking incredible. Fucking incredible that people are still coming out despite the crazy flights. Bands that were, we had to push one step closer later in the day because they were flying from Europe. Terror literally doing the same thing. Flying Germany directly to Philadelphia just to make the set. Second to last set of the entire weekend. Flying in and flying in general has been a fucking massive headache for everybody in the world. And yet people were getting it done. It's a, it's still important to me to you know, just be thankful that people are willing to travel. Willing to support. And I really appreciate the support that went out. And so... I've done a better job of not letting words alone or people's perspective damper my overall outlook. You know, and, um, you know, sometimes when you're dealing with hot headed people, you have to treat them with a kindness or a nullified position of passivity so they don't continue to ramp up the aggression and the uncivility of it all. You know, like, it's times where people get hate it, and it was important to keep a uh, a really cool mindset, you know, throughout the whole thing. It's times when people, even your closest friends, may not see eye to eye with you, and you have to back up and take a step and figure out what's the best way to get the best outcome for all parties, and that was a huge thing for me, and I think that. In hindsight, just having the opportunity to think about this kind of stuff and try to make the active change really allowed me to have a better festival with less ramp-ups. And, um, you know, we're always going to have things that are made to be a thought that's going to stay for months. It's months of me thinking of better ways to do some of this stuff, better ways to do this. The, the shorter timeline, which as I said in another episode, is like this fest is just like a wedding. You pick the day it's going to happen, and everything from the day you pick the day it's going to happen, I'll spend some point in a day in thought, in practice, in email, in phone, in text, on this podcast, working towards that goal. And it becomes all-consuming. So the important thing for me is to... Understand that this was a tremendous success for us in the shortest amount of time it's ever taken to do a This Is Hardcore. And yet, at the same time, the argument can be made I had from 2019 to 2022 to pull it off. But the uncertainty of the pandemic, I had to mentally shut off parts of the fest no matter how many times people were asking. And yet, I got to say that the messages and the comments, is this coming back? Is this coming back? It really did keep 
the flame from going out. And throughout the the two years we didn't do it, there was actual hundreds of messages and comments made towards I can't wait for it to come back, people asking when they thought. And when we chose to do the fest around what Hatebreed's schedule would allow them, we lost some people that couldn't make it because they're usually traveling or they you know, they had planned, couldn't get time off. Or with the situation with the way flights are being oversold and so much money, we missed out on some people. So just with the successes alone, I'm thankful. Overall, I can look at this as hardcore 2022 and say that because of my mindset, I'm looking at this as one of the best we've ever done. And yet... There's so much more to it. Uh, we have now a whole new generation of kids from the Fool's Game reaching out, killing me crowd who just showed up even though they were playing or they bought a ticket and we're just trying to help out on day one and we're the ones able to break down and get it all back in its place at the end of the night. It's a warm amazing feeling to see the new people coming in to help out and and be able to give this is hardcore the opportunity to continue because this stuff it does take time you know friday before we were over at the underground arts we were making the new tents that we had purchased marked so it was easier to put up on saturday and we came up with a system kind of had a game plan for a layout Saturday morning, people being there to execute it was fantastic. People that came outside, gave us a hand, moving tables, moving blocks. I mean, you got young kids grabbing and walking with concrete blocks and picking up tables and putting tents away. It's awesome. It's awesome to see that the community was there out of the younger people whose bands either have played the fest or soon will play the fest, which is regulars at the shows. And I, I hope that they are instilled with a sense of ownership and community and that this is their thing. And it's good to see them put care and love and work into it. Maybe they'll see that nothing we do or venture to do can come without work and come without sacrificing time, come without a little bit of you know sweat, not so many tears, but that nothing done in hardcore doesn't come without hard work. But it's appreciated beyond the, anything I can say in words. And they all know that. And I hope that in the years to come that we continue to have s- such eager people to help out and do the right thing by us. I know it's weird to start a podcast about This Is Hardcore and the recap off with Marcus Aurelius Meditations. But as I get older, I understand better that mindset and the way that Things will work. The the psychology of it has to be in place. I have to understand a lot of different things. And I have to, because I want to lead the team and do the best thing for everybody, I had to set my shit right. You know, no, no shoulder patting here, just honest public accounting, specifically that, there are there is in me a lot of transformations the way I look at how things are done so that way we the best outcome can be made. And there's so many people that helped out. I mean, so many people that aren't mentioned here. And I just have to say that everybody who helped out and everybody just gave a hand, asked how can I help, what can I do, absolutely fucking kicked it up a notch. It just made it so much easier to keep the head and the mindset going. And uh, that's all. That's where I'll leave it. Moose is awesome. So. For me. Specifically. Looking at. The entire weekend. I mean. It was fucking. Everything that I had hoped. And then beyond. Thursday. The first night of the festival. There was a. Reason why this was all put together. We always did Thursday shows as starting as early as 2009. And the first one was, I said before, we did like a, just an all-Philly show. Church was packed. 
and that was the beginning of the pre-shows. This year, the combinations of old Philly favorites like H2O, Scarhead, and then the exclusive set by Tsunami, the up-and-comers like Carried by Six and Hold My Own and Karma, and some of these bands that are just coming up in the world. You know, you had a, a balance of older bands made up of people who have been in hardcore bands for years who have started new bands, and then guys who have new bands. It's hard to come out. It's hard to get people to see them. So the balance is what I did, and I really felt like it hit a home run. It was a... You had some hard moshing and some cool vibes, and it, it was great. It was everything I'd hoped for in a chill, beginning, warm-up day for the fest. Izak alone made the highlight reel just for his commentary. H2O was fantastic. Tsunami. Man, sometimes when you put a lot of these young bands together, it gets hard for every band to get the same kind of reaction. So I'm going to say that. Tsunami playing on Thursday really made their set stand out even further than what it would have been. So, just big shout-outs to all the bands who played on Thursday. Underground Arts made things incredibly easy. Friday was a different matter entirely because that was like, okay, now now we're dialed in. Now we know what we got to do. Uh, a couple more bands. Last-minute switch-up. Vane back on top. And I had all the hopes in the world that the Fool's Games, the Risks, the Hesitates, and the world would get great reactions early on from people who traveled so far. Big big crowd who came for the three-day pass in that room. And then Varials, who missed out a chance of playing in this hardcore a couple years ago, really fucking set it off. Hangman, Michael obviously is killing it with the pain of truth, and we'll get into that, but... I always tell them, Hangman's a shit. Don't give up on it. Hangman had a great set. The Hoods returned. They played back in the pandemic, so they hadn't played in a while, and they continue to do what Mikey Hoods does in the best way possible. Punishment, my band, got told last minute we weren't going to have the bass player. We thought, as we had one of the most professional drummers we've ever had, Chris Hamilton, from so many different bands. So last minute, fill in Mike Ferrero shirtless maniac throwing the bass into the crowd became a viral sensation and was probably the most fun we've had in a while playing queensway's one of my favorite bands from this area killed it from baltimore section hate la man so fucking sick so glad we had them on the bill and then Vane, you know we had them on the bill they were going to play the sunday in the spot that actual kubla Khan ended up in but with the injury of matt they pulled off, and then they wanted to jump back on, so we made it happen. And they closed out the fest, and it was awesome. And a great way to cap off the Underground Arts Fest dates. Saturday, again, the, the setup was easier than I expected. Very happy with the way the front lot looked. The addition of more food trucks back there, with the extra lane for parking and artist check-in in the back room, in the back lot made us have to move stuff and I believe personally that having that lot made people walking in and out of the venue so much easier there wasn't so much congestion and um, we are going to be bringing more food options next year knowing that the space we have we didn't fully use and and this gives us more time to look at what we did right what worked well I mean Cracker A1 Concessions the first people that came to the fest to sell food back with snow cones and pulled pork and all this all the awesome stuff Along the bar was great. Uh, I mean, Lucky's Barbershop was great. Sunday, I got a haircut. It was, you know, it's fucking awesome to have those guys back. And all our usual vendors, you know, uh, Preserving Hardcore, AJ, Ty, Pittsburgh guys. I mean, there's so many people that came to support the fest again. It was great to have our old friends back in the lot and new friends coming. But the bands are really where it shined. Reaching out. This is the band from New Jersey. Second generation I mean, guys from Second to None, guys from Demise and Madball Marauder, and Casey from Gen Fanther, their son Caden, being a part of the next generation of hardcore from amazing New Jersey, New York hardcore families is incredible. And reaching out, go to every single fucking show. They're ubiquitous. PA, Connecticut, New Jersey, Long Island, New York City, 
It's amazing to see what these young kids do. And they opened up Saturday, and they were fucking fantastic. Hostilities came a long way from the Pacific Northwest. Their own Bullet Tooth, which is the new label by Josh Gabriel, who did Trust Kill, absolutely set it off. Off the trucks, Bob Wilson, you know the deal. That was fucking sick. Very aggressive. Fuck yous. I love all of it. I live it down from Ohio. Man, truly carrying the banner of the new era of that classic Ohio sound. Simulacra, man, what a set. Powerful. And showing you that with the new record that they're going to be a force. Wait till their tour. Make sure you see them. And it probably had the first big fest fest kind of feeling set which is still really early on age of apocalypse was awesome 25 years of strength for a reason it was great to have them on the stage powerhouse first time you ever played this hardcore a band returning to um this is um to the east coast and playing new record you know this is awesome to see an older band up there playing kids finally getting to see him old heads finally getting to see him it's fucking awesome mushmouth this time out, they did a little bit more of the out to win material, but fucking fantastic. Pain of Truth may have had one of the biggest sets of the entire fucking weekend, especially so early. In fact, Pain of Truth into Never Ending Game, into Drain was already wild enough. And it was fucking fantastic. And we never had any of those bands on the bill before. Um, Pain of Truth and Never Ending Game, that is. Drain had played in 2009. Train, we threw out some boogie boards and beach balls. <laughs> it was fucking hilarious and awesome. Ringworm, wow. Hit after hit after hit. Same thing for Wisdom and Chains. Uh, you know, they played every year but one. And again, highlight reel every single song. Matt from Noise finally sang his part and already dead. All at War, what do you want, man? That was fucking fantastic. Make sure to check out All at War and Ringworm. They're on tour together through August. Bunch of East Coast dates. Don't miss out on that. Killing Time, one of my favorite bands of all time. Absolutely fantastic to see them after after the passing of Rich McLaughlin up on stage doing what they do best. Make sure to support July 30th. There's still tickets for the Killing Time Breakdown Memorial Show for Rich McLaughlin in Brooklyn. What do you do? You got Fury of Five. First show was in New Jersey, second in Philadelphia at this hardcore, and they fucking brought it. Once again, Anthony Etown uh, returned to his spot. Special guest on the one and all remix verse. Fantastic. And I think this one was even crazier than the first show. If you're, uh, Madball. You know what Madball does. They go out there. They give you the hits. And it was really great to see them back at the fest. After they hadn't played in a couple years. And hardcore young kids need to see Madball. They need to see these bands like Fury of Five, Killing Time, All at War. As, long, you know, as well as... Supporting the drains and the pay the truce and the never in the games and all the younger bands. I wanted to put a, a classic lineup together for these younger kids who just got into hardcore. And this is their first. This is hardcore. They get to see some of the best of the best. And there's something to be said about Hatebreed. Where, you know, they say they were celebrating 20 years of perseverance. But they did such a heavy presence of, per, of satisfaction and under the knife stuff. My hat's off to all of them. They, you know, Matty Burns was in the Alt War before he was in Hatebreed. Wayne's an OG Hatebreed member. Frank Three Guns, dude, he's been in everything. Integrity, Ringworm, to Terror, to Hatebreed. Beatty out there killing it. And Jamie, I mean, this guy, for people who are younger and don't realize, long before Hatebreed was synonymous, not just with hardcore and satisfaction, depth of desire, but was just a powerhouse. And a DIY fucking king in, Cal in Connecticut. Did so much for that scene. Networked with so many bands. And to see him up there doing them songs in a no barricade situation was fucking phenomenal. And finally, like a, that's like a check off the list of wish we could have sets. And I thank those guys for that. It's kind of hard. You roll into Sunday and it's like, fuck, we're already here. Last day. Foreign Hands probably had one of the best amount of people I've ever seen in the room early. 12 o'clock's hard for people to show up and there were people in the room. Hats off to those guys. Struck Nerf, you, you know, Philly's Youngblood representatives, they fucking killed it. And we had them on early and they didn't disappoint. They fucking brought it. Hats off to them for showing up early and kicking ass. New York City's, I don't know why they're sleeping on this band, but Combust is 
the most classic sounding New York City band in a generation. And I don't think that they even get enough love in their own city. Absolutely fi- fucking fantastic. C- Chemical Fix, Philly Zone, really just killing it. And they le- they left the stage with an Ink and Dagger cover, which they did many years ago. Not many, but a couple years ago, back when Bob did his first Philly barbecue. Seed of Pain from Florida. I knew they'd have that set. A song or two into it, it just picked up. And, it, you know, the first three songs were just fucking warming up. And it was just a killer set. MH, if you know, you know. We've been capping these guys since I started this podcast. Used to do some of the songs as their intro. Played their songs multiple times. Helped them get the record out on Fast Break and From Within. And it was just fantastic. This is like a dream for all of us. They finally could play the fest. It just took two more years than we thought to happen. But they did it. And it was fantastic. Raw Brigade. A lot of memes. A lot of people talking shit. Oh, when's Fast Hardcore going to be cool again? Well, here it is. To see Latinos speaking their language to so many kids. I had so many kids come up to me from Chile, Venezuela. It's important that these people are represented in hardcore. Carlos and the group do such a fucking beautiful job of playing pure, unadulterated, real fucking hardcore. And to see the people come out and love it, it's fucking fantastic. And it's something that really warmed my heart. And I was so happy that they had the, the reaction that they did. Shackled. This is the young guns, man. Out there touring, doing the right fucking thing. And they fucking smash it. Absolutely fucking legendary going from opening set of this hardcore to now. Fucking fantastic. Life's Questions. Woo, man, that's a set. That record's something else. The band is just going to keep moving forward. Great to see them. Now, we had to wait for one step closer because they were flying in. And regularly, there's no, there's no, crazier, there's no crazier vocalist in hardcore. Seb, he's the fucking man. That was insane. That was insane. You know, uh, when the lineup shift happened in Europe and Maddie became the vocalist for Year of the Knife, there was some skepticism. And I feel like her presence and power on stage was shown and that people going forward are going to be really excited for what they do with Maddie on vocals. A great set, and a great first American set with Maddie on vocals. See you, Space Cowboy. Connie and them came out. Guns blazing. Kids from all different places were excited for them. And it was a good set for those. This is the first time we've had them on the bill. Booked them previously. But a great band that separates a different category. I'd say not totally away from hardcore. But adding a an, an, another element that attaches into the end stuff. Along with the misery signals and the Kubacon thing. A lot of these kids are not listening to Killing Time and Warzone. And maybe we will never get them to do that, but they support every single hardcore show in the city, in the area. Even though they listen to that more metallic stuff, I know them to be kids that are pure in hardcore. It's just a different time. And to put bands like CU Space Cowboy and Varials is important because so many of these kids still support the regular hardcore shows that Bob and Alex and myself do. It's good to see them representing for the bands that they used to check out. At the smaller shows, at the voltages and stuff like that. I'm very happy to have Sea of Space Cowboy on the bill. And they did great. And then it really just turned up a notch. I mean, Gridiron, you knew that they were going to be a highlight reel set. It was, I mean, I got to sing my part. I love them guys, you know. Boyertown's finest. And you can listen to those episodes and check out Matt's thoughts on it. It's hard to talk about this one, but it's important, you know. For those who listen to the episodes... Eddie has been fighting cancer, and we've had him on a couple times now. But realistically, there was moments where I didn't even know if he was going to make it to this hardcore 2022. Yet he gets up with Gabby and Artie, who have been in the band, and play probably one of the most amazing, technically proficient, awesome-sounding sets. Very open, mouth-kiss-heavy related material. Something that we hadn't heard, as they usually focus a lot on the Rise and Fall stuff. Fucking fantastic, and... The epic way the set goes out, I'll leave you to watch Hate Five Six, but it brought me to tears. Eddie is the man. I love him. I'm so glad that he had the ability to push through and fight cancer and get on the stage that night. And then it just got ignorant from that minute onward. I mean, this is the first Kubla concert of the fest. 
And they've been working their way through the years. They did some tours with Terror. Another band that kind of started in a more metallic way. And warming the hearts of these hardcore kids. These kids that kind of can do both. I hate that there's even a both. It's just a, it's just bands. But that's the way it's perceived. And we'll, we'll keep it to that. Cuba kind of fucking easiest band to deal with. Cut a song from their set because things were running short um, on time. Just did everything right. Pure in their hearts to the hardcore scene, despite having a monstrous sound that is way more metallic than the average hardcore band. And my hat's off to them for the set that they had. And then, you know, Misery Signals is this band that can be traced all the way back to the early 2000s when metalcore was really starting to grow. But let it be known, they played all the halls and all the small clubs before they got to where they were at. And the combination of Comeback Kid and Misery Signals and End on that tour is what got them on the bill, and they were absolutely exceeded any expectations. The fans were fucking thrilled, and just an outstanding stellar set from them. Comeback Kid has not played This Is Hardcore since 2009, I believe. Might have been eight. I think it was nine, though, and absolutely fantastic. Great to have them back, and they really set it off. So many young kids and old friends up front for that one, and then it really does say a lot about Terror that they're willing to end a European tour, jump on a plane, sleep overnight, jump into Philadelphia. Two hours later, they play one of the best sets I've ever seen them play. Top three Terror sets I've ever seen Terror play. One of the best Philadelphia sets they've ever played. And this is the first time they ever played the Franklin Music Hall slash Electric Factory as part of this hardcore. They played the factory, but they've never played as part of this hardcore. And I was giving Scott some fucking shit for it. And he got up there, and they fucking annihilated it. And it was exactly what I was hoping for. And with that new record, Pain and the Power, that we went into, what a fucking great way to see them play This Is Hardcore at the Factory for the first time. And then Thursday, you know, these are hardcore kids who band embodied the early 2000s victory movement for everybody from Philadelphia to New Jersey. So many people who go on to start awesome hardcore bands grew up on this full collapse record. And, you know, people kind of scratch their head who aren't from around here. Like, oh, wow, Thursday is that popular? There's people leaving in tears. There were people mind blown. There's people who've been going to hardcore shows for years. It's just stayed, checked out Thursday, and were like, such a powerful emotional presence this band had. And uh, I really just thank them for doing it. And it was a fucking fantastic way to end this, the the festival, to walk out on a good note. Everybody's smiling, singing along. It was just everything. This fest was everything. And I can't speak on much else besides we'll figure out if the dates shift. It'll shift later than earlier. And unlike previous years where I might be like, ah, I got a couple months to really start thinking... There's already a laundry list. It's even longer than before. Improvements. Things we're going to do differently. Things we'll uh, make happen. Now that we have the time, we have a new idea of like, okay, this is what the fest is going to look like. The venue was bought by AG, which is a corporate entity. But the people working on the inside to do all the real decision making are all people that we've worked with for 10 years since we came to the factory. And if anything... Our friendships have been strengthened, and my hat's off to Tony, the manager, who's the most punk rock venue manager you'll ever fucking meet, and Kevin Horn. They really did the great job of protecting the This Is Hardcore punk chaos from the AEG corporate world and Jerry Market and everybody who just at the venue did their best to keep the way that the fest has always gone the same way despite new things like a a different security company, which did a fantastic job and, you know, just help us usher in the first This Is Hardcore that we've had without Brian Dilworth and without getting insanely emo here. There was tons of moments where I was just, there was frustration moments where I wish Brian was there to ask him what he would want to do or have his insight or help and, as I said to Kevin and Tony, they did their best and they filled his shoes and his role and they've chauffeured This Is Hardcore into an era where we can go back to the factory. We now know what it's going to take to do it without Brian. And it's just hard. It's always going to be hard. 
when someone who is the link and the starting point had such a presence to be able to fix problems with this literally Marcus Aurelius level calm of like, well, so always I never even heard him really raise his voice. He might have some sarcastic shit to say, but he was never one that raised his re- voice or overreact and was always able to calm me the fuck down. And I don't know where you sit on those who are dead and what they see, but if if there is a presence and he saw what we were up to, I hope he was proud of what we put together. And I hope that he knows that I kept my word when in 2019 he said, just promise me that you're not going to not come back next year. And with COVID and him passing the week before COVID was even anyone's words or knew about it, I didn't get a chance to fulfill it until 2022. But we came back and we did the best with the two bands that we were talking about doing the last time we were talking about doing this hardcore hate breed on Thursday. I'm in a bizarre, weird stretch. We were trying, as I said in previous episodes, the goal in 2020 was that we had already had secured the first East Coast show for Circle Jerks. And it wasn't without some irony that the Circle Jerks had then played in Philadelphia right around the time of this hardcore happening. <laughs> as like a mild fuck you almost. But I just hope he, I hope he can see what we did and be happy with it. And... I hope that those who have encountered me previous to best or heard of my insane overreactions or short temper and stress levels can understand that I anyone can grow and change if they put their mind to it. And sometimes it takes a long time to do that. And it's taken me a long time to do that. But I'm thankful personally, professionally, and privately that through the years of this fest from 2006 to 2022 16 years with only two years off the biggest gift i can give my friends who put their entire fucking ass and soul into this is not having some fucking stupid comment come from me or me losing my hand my face on fucking scream about something stupid i know i was a jackass and i know that it wasn't the best representation of how i am and i hope specifically that those who doubted me when I said I'm not going to be rude this entire festival understand that with good people around and good things to look forward to and goals to achieve and a new precedent to set that anyone if they're really mindful of it can change and do better and this was the summer where I taught myself that I can change in those ways and I love all of you for supporting me I love everybody who did something great for the fest just posted a story and talked about it and supported and There will be more. Just thank you. Take care.